Yeah, welcome to uh, our second presentation on the topic of Byzantium and the steps. Uh, this time uh, focusing on the 8th to 9th century, uh, especially on the relations of the Byzantine Empire to the Bulgars and the Khazars, but also again with a wider view on the Eurasian steps to the Uyghur Empire. Um, my name is Johannes Preiser Capella. I'm working at the Division for Byzantine Research of the Institute for Medieval Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And one of my main research topics is the entanglement between the Byzantine Roman Empire and the wider world of Afro Eurasia. And as I've said, this is the second part. The first part uh, of this talk was covering on the 6th and 7th century, and you also find it on our channel. Das andere Mittelalter. So if we try to embed these relations between Byzantium and the wider steppes uh, over these centuries, uh, we shall have a look at this map, uh, the geopolitical situation in Afro-Eurasia around 580, where we have the big sedentary empires, so the Roman Byzantine Empire, Sasanian Persia, and in this time again, uh, the beginning also of a political reunification of China. And in the steps, as we have seen in the last episode, uh, we have, of course, the, at this time still uh, impressive power formation of the Turkish Khanate with an Eastern and a Turk and Western Turkish Khanate. And at that time also the emergence of the Avar Khanate in the Carpathian Basin, but also still holding dominance over parts of the Pontic steppes to the north of the Black Sea. So this is the situation, say, towards the end of the 6th century. As we have seen the last time, as we have seen the last time, the situation has very much changed at the end of the 6th, uh, of the 7th century, around 700. So we have now as the new superpowers, the Arab Caliphate under the Umayyad dynasty, uh, which also tries several times to, to capture Constantinople. Uh, but also is expanding towards Central Asia and here then encountering the expansion of the Tang dynasty. We have seen as the, the Tang were able to conquer both the Eastern and the Western Turkish Khanate and also expanding their dominion all the way into uh, Central Asia. And we will also see how these two superpowers are clashing. So in comparison to this, the Roman Byzantine Empire has become a minor or regional power in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's not longer one of the world dominating superpowers, but still it is uh, in um, close connections to the neighboring polities and also to the polities of the steppe. Uh, the others have become less important, especially after the defeat uh, in the siege of Constantinople in 626. Um, and by the end of the 7th century, after 680, they have been replaced, one could say at the Danube or at the lower Danube as the main step opposite part for Byzantium by the Bulgars, who have arrived here under Asparuch around 680. And the, uh, Constantinople, after a short war, had to acknowledge this establishment of the Bulgar polity at the Lower Danube. And on the other side of the Black Sea, we have the Khazars, who uh, had defeated the Great Bulgarian Empire to the north of the Black Sea and had established themselves as predominant power in the steps to the north of the Black Sea and of the Caspian Sea, and they became an important ally of the Byzantines, as we will see. So this is more or less the geopolitical situation at the end of the 7th century. If you have a closer look at the Mediterranean, we see here clearly how the former Roman Byzantine Empire has been now reduced to mainly Asia Minor. Some remaining uh, bases in the Balkans, of course, in the hinterland of Constantinople around Thessaloniki, and some naval bases also in the Greek area, and also some uh, remaining um, provinces in Italy, in southern Italy. Ravenna is still uh, 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 under Byzantine control until the mid of uh, mid eighth century. And vis-a-vis -vis is the big superpower, the Umayyad Caliphate, which is now reaching from India all the way to North Africa. A few years later, in 711, the Arabs will also cross over the street of Gibraltar to conquer Visigothic Spain. 
Um, and then there are the other neighbors. So the Bulgars we have mentioned, various Slavic formations on the Balkans, the Avars in the Carpathian Basin. In Italy, uh, the Lombards who try also to get hold of the remaining uh, Roman Byzantine uh, positions. Then the Franks as emerging uh, important power in Western Europe and the Khazars to the east of the Black Sea. So that's the situation if we zoom in more on, on Constantinople and on the Byzantine Empire. These constellations in the steppes to the west and the east of the Black Sea uh, with the Khazars and the Bulgars can be very much uh, illustrated, especially at the turn from the 7th to the 8th century with the adventures, one could say, with the adventures of one uh, emperor, Justinian II. Justinian II uh, is the last scion of the dynasty established by Emperor Heraclius in 610. And Justinian II in 695 loses the throne in Constantinople after a coup d'etat. And he also loses his nose. Uh, so therefore, he has the, the, the name, by name, Renotmetos, so those whose nose is cut off. As you can also hear, see here very drastically in this late medieval manuscript. Um, and he's sent to exile to Hersonesos on the Crimea, but he is able to escape from this exile and to make his way to the nearby now Khazar Empire. Uh, the Khazars at that time have their uh, center of their power still to the north of the Caucasus in what is now Dagestan, but also have expanded, as we have explained, to the steppes to the north of the Black Sea, also into the Crimea. So they have become neighbors of the cities in the south of the Crimea, which are under the influence of Constantinople. And now Justinian II is able to escape and is even accepted by the Khan of the Khazars, uh, not only as a refugee, but also as his son-in-law. So he uh, is, is, um, gets into marriage with, with the daughter of the Khan, uh, who then also is baptized and, and uh, under the name of Theodora. So the couple is now living under in the in the Khazar realm, and of course Justinian is uh, thinking about how to get back to Constantinople. But then, unfortunately, diplomats arrive from Constantinople, and the regime there is making an offer to his father-in-law, uh, which the Khan cannot reject. Uh, so also a high sum of money, if he would uh, turn over Justinian dead or alive to. Uh, the Byzantines. Uh, Justinian II, however, um, is informed about this uh, conspiracy and Justinian II is able again to escape. And this time he travels to the west, to the lower Danube, and is accepted at the court of the Bulgarian Khan, Tervel. And with the help of Tervel and the Bulgars, he is able to make his way now to Constantinople and also with the help of some groups within the capital to get into the capital and to return on the throne. Uh, in the manuscript you see to the left that he's taking also bloody revenge on uh, the now ruling emperors there, and he returns on the throne for another six years. So he is both uh, now connected to the Khazars and to the Bulgars, and especially of course to, to Tervel. He is uh, he has to, to thank him for, for helping him to get back on the throne. And this he does, uh, of course, via um, handing over a big sum of, of money and many presents. And also Tervel uh, receives the high-ranking Byzantine title of Kaiser, so even normally used for co-emperors. So Tervel is really acknowledged as an important partner of the family of, of rulers connected to the Emperor of Constantinople. <clears throat> and um, there was even, there's even the, the one hypothesis that this episode and this, this high rank now Tervel received uh, is connected to the famous horseman of Madara uh, in, in Bulgaria, which is also for modern day Bulgaria an important national symbol. You can also find it on coins. Um, and this horseman of Madara, the, uh, the, you see here a Bulgarian ruler who is uh, on horse and beneath the horse there's, there's a lion. And there are also so-called proto-Bulgarian inscriptions next to the horseman of Madara. 
Uh, and as many of these inscriptions, they are in Greek language, but have also some uh, Bulgarian um, words included, and sometimes they are very hard to interpret. And one interpretation of this particular inscription uh, is that it also refers to the emperor with the nose cut off, which would be Justinian II. But this is only a hypothesis. Interestingly, also, uh, we uh, learn also from, from the so-called prince list of the Bulgars that this relatively newly established uh, Bulgarian polity on the lower Danube uh, and the ruling dynasty, of course, is connecting uh, itself to the wider imperial traditions of the steppe. So this prince list, as the hypothesis that it was originally written also in the form of a proto-Bulgarian inscription in Greek and then later translated into Slavonic. And, uh, uh, but it more or less is, is an older text from the late 7th or late 8th century. And it, it, it lists the rulers uh, and the ancestors of the ruling family of the Dulo dynasty. And you also have here Tervel mentioned. And you have Esperich, Asperich, so the founder of the Bulgar realm at the Lower Danube. But if you um, go further back in this in this in this row of ancestors, you come to two prominent names: Irnik, uh, who is identified as Hermak, who was one of the sons of Attila, the Khan of the Huns, and Avitohol, who is mentioned here as the first ancestor of the clan of the Dula. This, uh, this name is identified as Attila. But as you can see here from uh, the indications how long these first rulers lived that we are also here in the realm of legend. But still, the idea is that there is some remembrance of this earlier great empire of the Huns uh, more than 200 years uh, before the, the Bulgars come to the lower Danube and they, they try to connect to these imperial traditions also in this uh, steppe area. Um, the good relations between Justinian II and Tervel are relatively short living in 708. We find the Byzantines and the Bulgars again in war against each other, and uh, Justinian II suffers defeat in the Battle of Anhialos at the Black Sea. Um, and um, this more or less ends the good relations between Byzantium and the Bulgars for some time until after the death of Justinian II. In 711, Justinian II is again overthrown, and this time he loses his life. And the successors then, his successors then decide that it is uh, wise to get to an agreement again with the Bulgars. Uh, and this then leads to, as far as we can reconstruct, to another Bulgarian Byzantine treaty in 716, uh, which especially also includes regulations on the trade. Uh, between the two polities, which is especially also important for the Bulgarian side. And it is here also uh, regulated that traders uh, would only be allowed to cross the border and to, to, to do commerce in the polities if they have an authentication, dia sigilion kes fragidon, so uh, through seals and sealed documents. And such seals, we can imagine at least from the Byzantine side, can be connected to the activities of the so-called commerciari. So these were officials who were responsible also for trade and the, uh, the, the taxes connected to trade. And we find them located, especially in this region, in Mesembria, in Nesebar, which was at that time the of official trade post also between the two empires. And we also have seals from that time here of one Thomas uh, Comerciarios of the Apotheki, so of the, the warehouse of Mesembria. And we can imagine that these are the seals this treaty also is referring to. Um, the Byzantine emperor's uh, need to, to make peace with, with the Bulgars is also connected to another more, more uh, dangerous threat. And this dangerous threat comes from the Arabs. So there is another attempt or the, the second big siege of Constantinople. So uh, just to refer to some recent findings, normally you will still find in handbooks that there was a first Arab siege of Constantinople in six, between 674 and 678. However, in recent studies, especially of Marek Jankowiak, it has been, I think, and this is also now more or less communist opinion, 
that uh, we have to be aware that the, the main source for that siege, the Chronicle of Theophanes, Confessor, uh, is not reliable, that the, uh, the documentation of Theophanes somehow is confused, that we actually should uh, reckon with a series of, of Arab attacks, especially in the 660s, but not one four-year-long siege as Theophanes is describing. However, in 717, we really have here a big uh, Arab undertaking of, of capturing Constantinople. Um, and the Byzantine emperors were already informed about the preparations of the Arabs, and therefore they were also prepared to make peace with the Bulgars. And uh, we hear about an Arab army marching through Asia, Asia Minor, crossing over to Europe and then laying siege to Constantinople, and then also uh, an Arab fleet arrives. So Constantinople is really under threat now from the land and from the sea. However, um, it has two allies and one uh, important tool to, uh, to successfully uh, defend Constantinople. One is the famous Greek fire, as it is called, or the Igoron Pier, the, the liquid fire, which was already used in earlier against the earlier Arab attacks which allows the Byzantine fleet to, to decimate the Arab fleet. Then the winter of 717 and 718 is extremely cold, which very much impedes the supply of the Arab army. So the, we, have, we have reports about a severe famine in, and also then an epidemic in the Arab camp. And eventually also then uh, the Bulgars, who most recently have made uh, peace with Constantinople, attack the Arab army uh, from the rear side, and all these in combination, this eventually uh, then convinces the Arab uh, uh, commander to uh, end the siege and Constantinople is saved again, which also then contributes to the legitimation of the only recently installed emperor uh, Leon III, who then is more or less the saver of the capital and on this basis then can establish his rule. And this is uh, a verse of, of a coin of, of uh, Leon III. So the Arabs are without doubt the most uh, severe danger for the, the Byzantine Roman polity. And so, of course, they are eager to find additional allies. And another ally from the steppe are the Khazars. As we have uh, seen, the Khazars established themselves as predominant power to the north of the Caspian and the Black Sea in the steppes. Uh, from the mid 7th century onwards, also defeating the Great Bulgarian Empire. And the center of the power at that time was still to the north of Caucasus in Dagestan. And from there, they start uh, to make uh, uh, frequent raids and attacks over the Caucasus in uh, the areas now under Arab uh, uh, control in, in eastern Georgia, in Armenia. Here is also a citation of the Armenian history of Revont. Uh, from the late 8th century, so that they frequently raided these areas and they also made advances even far more in the interior of the Arab ruled uh, territories, also to northwest Iran or Azerbaijan. And in 730, uh, we are even able to, to defeat an Arab army, a big Arab army, near the city of Ardabil. So the Khazars are, are really a threat to, to the Arab control over the southern Caucasian areas, and they also impede any advance to the north of the Caucasus of the Arabs. This also motivates the Byzantines, also in earlier traditions, we have seen that Heraklios in the 7th century is allying himself with the Western Turkish Khanate against the Sasanian Persian Empire, and along similar lines also then Leon III is, is establishing an alliance with the Khazars, and this is then also put on a, on a say, f uh, firm basis with another marriage, uh, another Khazar marriage. So the crown prince Constantine V is married to a Khazar princess, uh, whose name originally is Tzitzak, and then after her baptism, her name is Irini. Uh, and they also then have a son, who then even ascends the Byzantine throne, Leon IV, called the Khazar, so half Khazar, the Roman Byzantine emperor later on. Leon III and Constantine V are without doubt the uh, most important emperors of the uh, 8th century and 
they are really able to to stabilize uh, the Byzantine Empire after the severe crisis due to the Arab expansion since the mid uh, 7th century. They also, in, uh, Leon III is not only able to defend Constantinople, they're also then able to make successful campaigns in, uh, against the Arabs in, in Arab territory uh, and also to establish new military uh, uh, units. For instance, under Constantine V, you have the establishment of the Tagmata as a new elite uh, heavy cavalry units in Constantinople. However, their uh, reputation in later historiography is very bad uh, since uh, Leon III and especially Constantine V uh, also the emperors who initiated so-called iconoclasm, so a policy against the veneration of the holy icons. Um, the image and also the severity of these measures as depicted in later historiography has been uh, very much uh, discussed in recent scholarship. Uh, however, the theological core is also uh, in the, the Synod of Hierea, which, which is called together by Constantine V, that there are measures against the veneration of the holy images. And this is an ongoing theological debate then within the Byzantine church until the uh, mid ninth century. And since then in the end, the venerators of the, uh, the holy images uh, are on the winning side. Of course, late historiography is, is, is very antagonistic to um, these emperors, Leon III and Constantine V. Although we have some indications that they were, were rather very popular, both among the army and among the people, also due to their successful uh, military campaigns. Um, this alliance with the Khazars is a little bit uh, less uh, successful than a few years later, uh, when the Khazars then suffered defeat from an Arab army under the command of Marman ibn Muhammad, who later then also uh, uh, becomes a caliph of the Umayyad dynasty. And Marwan is not only able to defeat the Caucasus to the south of the Caucasus, but also uh, march to march across the Caucasus via the important fortress of Derbent, which is at the Caspian Sea, the main strategic uh, point uh, controlling the access over the Caucasus, and to advance into the Khazar territory and this is then still the, say, the core area of the Khazars. And uh, so the Khan and the elite of the Khazars even temporarily have to accept Islam. However, they decide then to, re to relocate the imperial center far to the north, so, so beyond the, 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 the grasp of, of, of the Arab uh, army. Um, and this is then the beginning of the establishment of Itil the capital or, of the Khazars at the Volga, which is also called Itil in the Khazar language, which is uh, connected to, to Turkish languages. Um, uh, unfortunately, Itil has not been located until now. There were some theories some years ago about new excavations to the south of Astrakhan, but there's no confirmation that this site was Itil. Uh, but however, this then allowed the Khazars to establish a new imperial center and also the, the acceptance of Islam is only, only an episode. Later on, we will talk about another aspect of religious change in the Khazar Empire. And Itil now on the region around the lower Volga now becomes the imperial center, the imperial core area, also the center of settlement of the Khazars. But the Khazar Empire also includes other uh, groups, ethnic groups, other formations which are integrated into this wide imperial network centered on the Khazars and their Khan. Um, across the steppes to the north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, also including groups like the Bulgars at the Volga, the Alans in the northwestern Caucasus, various Slavic formations, and it also is connected archaeologically so, to the so, so called Saltova Mayashkoya culture, which is dated in this period between the 7th and the 9th, 10th century. For, uh, for, for this culture, they have been identified more than 700 sites and monuments covering an area of around 500,000 square kilometers. Uh, so this is more or less the idea that this is the, say, the archaeological layer which can be identified with the Casa uh, realm uh, established at that time in this region. Um, 
from this time at the end of the 7th beginning of the 8th century we also have reports of the then religion of the Khazars. We have heard that for some time they have nominated to accept Islam after their defeat. Before that time uh, we have this report of one Bishop Israel who is sent from Caucasian Albania. So Caucasian Albania uh, was also a Christian polity neighboring uh, Armenia and, and, and Georgia. And we have the history of Moses Karakatvazi in Armenian language, which more or less is the main source on the history of this polity. And from there, there was sent a missionary, this Bishop Israel, to the Huns, as they are called, so to the steppe people to the north of, of, of the Caucasus. Um, and at that time, this is the region of Dagestan, this is the core region then still of the Khazars, so most probably these are Khaza, Khazars uh, who are here. Uh, described and uh, in this text we find the, the description that Bishop Israel first encounters the pagan uh, traditions of the of the religion of these people which of course is 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 is, is um, the peak of, of of stupidity for him uh, from the Christian perspective but we get here very interesting information about traditions we, we also find in other steppe people, especially also the veneration of the god of heaven Tengri, which until now you can find uh, venerated in various steppe traditions, is, for instance, a depiction from a, from a Mongol manuscript, so that the Khazars or, or, or groups under their control were following the traditions of the steppe religions, which we find also described in, in far distance regions uh, all the way to to east asia so that's a very interesting uh, passage in this in this uh, armenian text and from around the same time we also have a very interesting archaeological site which indicates also the far-reaching trade connections on which also then the Khaza empire was built <clears throat> and this is the site of moschevaya balka due to a special chemical composition of the soil, especially also here textiles were preserved, which otherwise is rather rare, uh, like this uh, silk uh, coat, uh, which is very interestingly uh, consisting of silks of various traditions, one could say of various uh, craftsmen traditions. So it's a composition of Byzantine silk, Islamic silk, and Soktian silk from Central Asia, so which indicates the far-reaching connections so Moschevaya Balka was on, located near, one could say, to a side route of what we call the Silk Road, where there are several Silk Roads, and this was also one, one route, which we also find described already in the 6th century, which also allowed direct connection between Central Asia to the north of the Caucasus, also circumventing, for instance, Sasanian Persia, or later also the Arab realm. And from there, by the Black Sea, there was a connection to Constantinople. So this is one route on which also the Khaza could build their empire or profit from these connections. And then there was, of course, also the option of a north-south direction. Uh, this connection also, also was already used in, in, we find, for instance, uh, Byzantine and Persian silver objects far to the north in the Perm region in, in Russia. But then this route be, uh, was more intensively used especially then from the late 8th century onwards, uh, when we also have the establishment of more peaceful relations between the Khazars and the Islamic Empire. But we see here the intersection of these far-reaching trade routes. Most of our bike is also unique that they are also preserved uh, not only these textiles, but also documents in Chinese and also Byzantine documents. Uh, these pieces of paper, for instance, uh, more or less parts of, of, of the notes of a Chinese merchant. So they include a Buddhist prayer, but also a list of commodities this merchant had bought. Um, and maybe he himself, or this merchant who is writing in Chinese script, made it all the way to, 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 to this region. And in the same side, we find this piece of silk, which has this inscription, which is devoted to a, 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 a certain Protospatarios Ivane. Protospatarios is a Byzantine court rank, which was obviously awarded to this Ivane, um, which whom most probably belonged to a, a local elite and was also an ally of the Byzantines and was awarded this gift of silk and also this title. Uh, as we have seen also other rulers of the steppe, for instance, were awarded titles or Tervel, the Khan of the Bulgars, 
uh, got this title of Kaiser, which was, of course, much more high ranking than Protos Batarios. So most of Balka is also, again, indicating this wide ranging connections across the steps, which with which we have to reckon with. Um, in these steps, in these wider steps regions around that time in the middle 8th century, we also have a clash of these superpowers, so the Arab uh, Caliphate, which had expanded towards Central Asia and the Tang Chinese Empire. And this is the famous Battle of Talas, where an Arab army encountered the Chinese army. Uh, the Arabs were victorious, also due to the defection of some parts of the Chinese army to the Arab side. And there were also some, some captive of, captives of war. And interestingly, some of these Chinese captives of, of war were later also able to return to China uh, via the sea route across the Indian Ocean. So really, uh, um, also, um, again, the manifestations of these global connections, which we have to, to, to take into consideration, also if we speak about Byzantium, uh, as part of this wider Afro-Eurasian world and the steppe world. <clears throat> Most more dramatic even for the in internal uh, development of these two superpowers were some um, events shortly before and after this battle of Talas. Uh, in the Arab case, this is the, the replacement of the Umayyad uh, Caliphal dynasty by the Abbasids. So another part of this wider, say, one could say, family of the Prophet Muhammad, and the Abbasids were able to gain the support of, especially also of groups in the Eastern Iranian Central Asian region, uh, especially also of, of, of members of the elites and of these populations who had converted to Islam, but due to the traditions at this time, were not considered, say, full members of the Islamic community with regard to their share in the polity or their share also in, 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 in certain privileges uh, of, 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 of the distribution of, of the, the booty of, of, of warfare, for instance. Uh, especially this group is called the Khorasanis. So Khorasan is a term for this entire big region in the east of Iran and then uh, bordering to Central Asia. And based on this support, the uh, Abbasid armies then made their way to the west and were able to defeat the Umayyads. And eventually then uh, the Abbasids were able to replace the um Umayyads, of whom only one part was able to es escape to Spain, where uh, a, a separate emirate was established. But in the core regions of, of the Caliphate, now the Abbasids were able to establish themselves. And this was also symbolized in 762 with the foundation of a new capital, Baghdad, under Caliph al-Mansur. And interestingly, uh, we also have then a revolution attempt in the Tang Dynasty shortly after the Battle of Talas. And this is connected to uh, the Sogdian Turkish general Andushan. So also the Tangs, as all these empires, were also employing uh, people and especially also warriors and, and generals of various ethnic origin. And the Turks have been had been integrated into the wider Tang empires. We have seen the Sogdians, a group from Central Asia, a Iranian speaking group, since the fourth century, many of them had made career in the Chinese polities. And Andushan had this twofold origin and was able to establish himself as a powerful commander to the north, uh, in the north frontier region of, of Tang China. But then there emerged a conflict between him and several court circles in the capital of the Tang, which is Chang'an, uh, near modern Xi'an, which was, if we regard the, the, the surface area, the biggest part of city of the time, a megalopolis of more than 80 square kilometers. And then Anno Shan, however, in 756, decided to rebel against the Tang and to march with his army towards the capital. He was even able to conquer the capital and to establish his own dynasty, which, however, was short-living. So after a few years, he himself was killed and then his son and successor was defeated. So the, uh, this revolution was not successful in, in contrast to the Abbasid one. Uh, but the Tang Empire forever was transformed, so uh, large areas uh, never came under direct control of the dynasty again. And they also had to rely now very much on support of other groups from the steppes, especially of the Ugu Uyghurs, as we will see. Um, before we talk about the Uyghurs, we have to talk a little bit about again uh, the, the developments in the steppes to the north of China. 
So as we have seen in the last episode, uh, in 630, the Eastern Turkish Khanate collapsed and was conquered by the Chinese. However, around 680, uh, the Turkish groups in this area were able to gain independence, one could say again, to establish a second Turkish Khanate uh, between 682 and 745. And especially from this Khanate, we also have a series of inscriptions in this runic uh, uh, alphabet we have uh, seen the last time, especially in the Ochran region. And there also is very interestingly this text of one of the leading generals of this, this empire, Don Yukuk. And he, for instance, warns here against uh, getting into close relations with the Chinese. So they should, uh, the, the Turks, the Tukuye, should uh, remain in the steppes, they should remain distant to the Chinese, they should, should maintain the traditional steppe life form in order to be able to, to fight against the Chinese as warriors, as steppe warriors, and they should avoid to build fortresses so that there would be no settlements the Chinese could easily attack. Uh, and they should also not accept uh, the teachings of the Buddhism or Taoism, so of, of religions circulating in China at the time. Uh, otherwise, they would become submissive and would be conquered by the Chinese again. Of course, this must be read under the impact of the earlier decades of Chinese overlordship of these regions. And now everything which more or less was connected to this period was rejected in this text. Nevertheless, also this second East Turkish Khanate collapsed eventually in the 740s. And the new predominant power in the steppes to the north of China became the Uyghurs. And one can say the Uyghurs did everything which uh, Ton Yukuk uh, was warning uh, against. Uh, so first of all, they established themselves as allies of the Tang Dynasty. They also supported the restoration of the Tang Dynasty in these fights against the Andushan rebellion. And then the Khan of the Uyghurs also decided to accept one of the religions which was uh, circulating in Central Asia and in China which had migrated there from Persia via the trade routes already since the 3rd century, and this is Manichaeism. This religion was established in the 3rd century by a prophet, one could say, Mani in 3rd century Persian uh, Sasanian Empire, uh, also using uh, models from Judaism, from Christianity and uh, traditional Iranian religion. And this was a missionary religion. Already Mani had sent missionaries all over uh, the neighboring regions. And especially also among the Soktian merchants, there was a group accepting Manichaeism, and then Manichaeism was also accepted in China as one religion which was allowed to be practiced. There were also temples and monasteries of, of the Maniche, uh, Manichaean religion, uh, which also made a separation between, say, the normal uh, members and then a group of electi, of elected, uh, one could say, monastic people who also avoided spoiling themselves or, 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 or with, with ma the material world too much. Um, and this Manichism uh, now became the official religion, one could say, of the Uyghur uh, elite. Um, and this is an interesting parallel to the Khazars, as we will see, the Khazars then later accepting Judaism. And also in this, in this case, for the Uyghurs, Manichism was, one could say, a third way between Buddhism, which was not the official state religion, but very important in China at the time. And another option would have been, of course, Islam, uh, the, the predominant religious power of the predominant power to the West. And Manichaeism somehow opened a third way. And similarly, also Judaism opened a third way for the Khazars between Islam and Christianity of Byzantium. So here we have an interesting parallel. So Manichaeism and Manichaeist uh, priests were established at the Uyghur court. Um, and another thing the Uyghurs did, they built a capital and uh, a very big capital. So this, you can see this aerial photograph. This is the central complex, which, which is still visible. But the entire capital of Ordu Balike, this is called in some sources, uh, within the fortifications, and there are several on ongoing archaeological project projects, cover the surface area of 33 square kilometers, which of course was not settled as densely as Chang'an or Constantinople, so there were wide areas also where the steppe nomads could have their tents for some 
seasons of the year and, and there were wide open spaces, but as the construction of such was also, of course, also a symbolic uh, manifestation of the power of these rulers. And this uh, city, also called Karabalgasun, uh, was um, built in Ötikan, so the traditional imperial center of the first and second Turkish Khanate in the Orkhon region. So also here symbolically, the Uyghurs took over this region as center for their imperial formation. As, and as you can see on the map, uh, Karabalgasun is also relatively near to another, then even more famous steppe capital. And this is Karakorum, then the, the capital of the Mongols. The Uyghurs, however, uh, also maintained, one could say, um, maintained some steppe traditions, uh, also as establishing an itinerant court. So there were various residences. At least another residential complex is identified uh, several hundred kilometers of, to the north of Ordo Balik, that's Bai Balik, uh, where archaeological excavation has not been so advanced until now. There have been established three fortified complexes, but also manifestations of imperial symbolism like this lion statue. So this was another residence. And then there's another uh, site which has been suggested also be, to be one possible residence of, of the Uyghurs. And this is Porbajin, Por now situated uh, in the Tuva uh, the Republic in uh, uh, the Siberian region of the Rus Russian Federation. This site is not so, of course, not so big as, as, as uh, Ordo Balik, uh, but very impressive also due to its to its uh, situation, the landscape in this lake on an island. Uh, but this um, this site was very, or is, is until now, very much uh, of, 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 of a riddle, one could say. Uh, so the, it was built also with the help or based on Chinese architectonical traditions. Uh, but obviously the site was not very used for very long. There are no signs for permanent or long lasting rule. Originally the dating was between 770 and 790, so maybe that it was in use for 20 years. However, there is a, a brand new publication published last week uh, in PNAS. Uh, by uh, Margot uh, Kuitems, and also including in the list of authors is Irina Shantseva, who is one of the excavators of Porbacin. And they were now able to establish a new uh, dating of this site uh, on the basis of three rings, and this exact, exact dating is to the year 770. So it would be very early in the uh, period when the Uyghurs had accepted Manichaeism, and one hypothesis had been that this was a Manichaeist monastic complex, and this seems to be now the most probable hypothesis, and this would also then explain why this site, or the existence, or the use of the site was so short-living, because if the site was built in 770, this was only three years ahead of an anti manichaeist coup d'etat, uh, of Tun Bagatar Khan, who replaced the, the ruling, uh, uh, the former ruler, Tengri Bögi Khan, uh, who they had supported Manichaeism and re established, say, the traditional religion. So, this would have also in, indicated, implied that the site of Port Bajin was given up only after three years, and this would also explain some of the enigmas of this site, one could say. And then eventually, then uh, later, the Uyghurs officially returned to Manichaeism, but Borbacin was not used again. And so this new dating also uh, say, tells a very interesting story within this larger uh, religious transformation of, of, of the Uyghurs and, and of the steppe polities. Um, so we have here around 780 also indications of an internal crisis of the Uyghurs. And uh, we can make similar statements about the, the Bulgars, uh, because also they encountered a severe crisis between the 750s and the 780s. And this is especially connected to the campaigns of Constantine V, so the son of Leon III. We have talked about the, also the, the military uh, successes of the so-called iconoclast empires. And after 
uh, stabilize, having stabilized the, the border to the Arabs, uh, Constantine V now started a series of campaigns and wars against the Bulgars, uh, which also included a twofold strategy. So there was the attacks from the south, but also the Byzantine fleet was bringing troops to the uh, delta of the Danube, so the Bulgar center was attacked from two sides. And this was a relatively uh, successful strategy, so we already written also that there were signs of disintegration of the Bulgar Empire, so internal fights due to these uh, uh, defeats, uh, and also some groups uh, defecting to the Byzantine side, a little bit similar to what we hear in the 590s when you have seen the last episode, when there were this, this series of Byzantine attacks on the Avars under Mauritius, uh, which also led to the defection of several groups from the Avars to the Byzantine side. And similar, one could say to, to this case at the end of the 6th century, when Mauritius then was killed and then and, 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 and this made, made it, brought an end to these campaigns, uh, the Bul uh, Bulgars were also able to uh, profit from the death of Constantine V in 775. Um, we still have, however, indications that also after the death of Constantine V, there were still internal turmoils in the Bulgar polity, and even a Khan, Khan Telerik, then uh, escaped or had to escape to Constantinople. He was, this is the usual Byzantine way, integrated into the Byzantine elite. Uh, of course, he had to receive baptism. His new name, name was Theophylactos, and we even have a Byzantine seal, which indicates that he also received the high-ranking court, high ranking court title of Patricios. Then he lived at the Byzantine court. Just a connection to popular culture. You can also play with Khan Telerik in the computer game Crusader Kings. So that's not an advertisement, it's just a reference to popular culture that uh, you can even find him in a computer game. However, then we have again a turn of, 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 of the fortunes of these polities of Byzantium and the Bulgars. Under Khan Kardamos, then the Bulgarian Empire was stabilized and was also able to defeat the Byzantines. So Constantine VI, the young emperor, uh, the, the grandson of, of Constantine V, was defeated then by the Bulgar army at Markela in 792. And this contributed to a weakening of his internal position, which eventually allowed his mother, Irene, in 797 to uh, make a coup d'etat against her son and then to rule as empress or as emperor, uh, as female emperor, uh, between 797 and 802. Um, this ex existence of a female emperor was also then used in the West in the Frankish uh, historiography to legitimize uh, the coronation of the Frankish king of Charlemagne as emperor in Constantinople as Roman emperor in 800. Charlemagne also is uh, you know, the one who brings an end to the Ava polity. We have talked about the Avas the last episode a lot and also after the defeat uh, in, in the siege of Constantinople 626 and some internal crisis, the Avars were able to restabilize their empire, maybe also on a different basis, more also on an agricultural empire. Um, but however, towards the end of the 8th century, this empire started to disintegrate, so already the campaigns of Charlemagne encounter a more or less fragmented polity. The Frankish troops are also then able to conquer the Ring, uh, so the center, which maybe was something like the capital or the, the residence of the Khan, where the uh, Frankish troops then were able to, to also get their hands on, on a huge amount of gold, so treasures of the Khan, maybe of also dating back to the period when there were still incoming golds from, from, from the Byzantine court. And then uh, the remains of the Avars were taken under uh, Frankish protection. So we find then until 822 also a small Ava polity under Frankish overlordship to the south of uh, Lake Ferti Neusiedlersee in uh, eastern Austria, western Hungary. But then this is the last uh, reference we have to the Avars in 822. However, uh, the Frankish uh, Empire was not able to take over the entire Ava controlled realm in the Carpathian Basin. Uh, the eastern parts then uh, fell into the hands partly of the Bulgars. 
So the Bulgars were also able to profit from the collapse of, collapse of the Ava Empire, especially under Khan Grum. Um, I have taken these maps, which you also can find on Wikipedia. However, they always suggest that this is like a firm national state. Uh, so not everything which is in this orange color was under firm control over the uh, over of the Bulgar rulers. Uh, so we also have to take into account so there were maybe also nominal overlordship. Maybe was what was more important than territorial gains was uh, the gain of additional uh, military force. So we have indications that Ava groups, remaining Ava groups, joined the Bulgars, which would have augmented the military power of the Bulgar ruler. And this uh, Khan Grum now used for another confrontation with Byzantium. In Byzantium, uh, uh, Empress Irini had been uh, replaced by one of her ministers, Nikephoros, who had been um, an official especially of the financial administration, and he made a lot of reforms, which brought him again bad, bad press in the historiography because he was also attacking the properties of the church. But he was trying to establish a new financial basis also for the military to establish new units. Also, he, there was a resettlement of population from Asia Minor to the Balkan provinces to, to re strengthen the, uh, the demographic and economic and military potential vis-a-vis -vis the Bulgar Empire. Um, and there is even now the, the interpretation by John Holden, for instance, that these reforms of Nikephorus are more or less the real start of what we then call the thematic system, the same system of the themata of the military provinces of Byzantium, which traditionally had been dated back to the 7th century, where there was, one could say, a process started, which led eventually to this new merge of, of military and civil administration, but also the term themata or thema first shows up around that time. And what we later find as, as the characteristic property of the system so that we have also uh, soldiers who are also uh, have their own lands and are military farmers, so to say, that this process only would start with Nikephoros. And one could say on the basis of this new Reforms also Nikephoros uh, had the idea more or less to, to make a decisive strike against the Bulgars. And in 811, a business army marched directly to the core area of the Bulgar Empire, to the north of the Balkan Mountains, uh, in the area around what then was or became the capital of the Bulgars of Pliska. So we then read that uh, the Byzantine army was able to advance until Blisk and even to celebrate Easter there. Uh, obviously, the Bulgars were, uh, were, were, uh, were, were, were giving space to the Byzantine army, one could say. Uh, however, this was misleading because on the march back, then uh, the Bulgarian army then attacked the Byzantine army in the Battle of, of Varbica Pass uh, in, 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 in the summer of 811. And in this battle, the Byzantine army was totally defeated and Emperor Nikephoros was killed. Um, and then he was, uh, his head even then was transformed into a, a drinking vessel for Khan Groom, as we read. And you see here also this depiction from the later, late medieval illustrated uh, version of the Chronicle of Manassas. Um, so this was, of course, was a symbolic, very dramatic, a Byzantine emperor here killed uh, by the barbarians and, and then even uh, finding such, such a dramatic end. And Groom then continued to, to exert uh, considerable pressure on the Byzantine. Also, then the next emperor, after Groom's uh, son, um, or after Nikephor's son Stavrakius, Michael I was defeated by the Bulgars in the Battle of Versinikia in summer 813, uh, which then also led to the replacement of Michael I by Leon V, who was also a military man. And Leon V then had to encounter even a Bulgar siege, one could say, of Constantinople. So Khan Groom marched to the walls of Constantinople. Uh, we even have a, a near contemporary resource, the so-called Scripto in Certus. Uh, and here we read that the Bulgarians now came to the gate of Constantinople's walls and according to the tradition, Groom made a sacrifice outside the Golden Gate. So this was the main also 
impressive uh, gate where, which was also used by emperors on the triumphal way to the to the Hagia Sophia and to the center of Constantinople. And Groom made a sac sacrifice outside the Golden Gate and sacrificed many people and many animals. Of course, he's also here depicted as a barbarian and a pagan. And on the coast of the sea, he wet his feet and surrounded by waves, he sprinkled his warriors. Also symbolically, he unites with the sea. It's interesting, we find similar descriptions about the Persian king Khusru I when he marched to the Mediterranean in the 6th century. Uh, however, this was more a demonstration of power. So there was no real attack on Constantinople in the same way as the others attacked Contrivilly tried to conquer Constantinople in 626 with dramatic consequences for the others. Maybe the Bulgars were more wise here. And then Groom, uh, after this demonstration, then led his troops uh, back. Uh, however, this time luckily for, for the Byzantines, he died. Uh, relatively soon afterwards, in April 814. And his successor, Khan Umurtak, then decided to make peace with Byzantium. So eventually a second Bulgarian Byzantine Treaty in 816, 817 was established, which more or less uh, uh, had similar uh, regulations as the treaty 100 years before but also in included additional transfer of defectors. So population and individuals who had changed sides, they should be given back to their uh, original polity, one could say. And interestingly, uh, we have most probably dated to this period also then an attempt from the Bulgar side to mark this new border. And this is the uh, well-known Erkesia or Old Bulgarian border wall, which over one, more than 130 kilometers is still visible in the landscape, uh, leading from the Black Sea coast to the river Maritza, and somehow also symbolizing this border. Um, and it has been compared to near contemporary other border, big border constructions like the Offa's wall of the Anglo Saxon king Offa vis a vis Wales uh, around the same period. So an interesting mon monument how also this steppe empire, so of course Bulgaria at this time being on the way to be becoming a more sedentary empire, but still also here symbolizing, marking their imperial frontiers, uh, similar to what we, for instance, find in the case of the Uyghurs. And similar to the Uyghurs is also the case of the emergence of this new imperial central landscape in and around Pliska. Uh, so we have seen in the case of Ordo Balik how these uh, steppe empires established uh, very big uh, centers, at least with regard to the surface area. And for instance, also the surface area of Bliska is bigger than the one of Constantinople. Um, of course, again, as in the case of Ordo Balik, these were not densely settled places like Constantinople or Chang'an. So one has called them low density settlements, and these are some uh, graphs also from the population of, of Joachim Henning, who together with Bulgarian scholars was doing undertaking excavations there. So there was, was again, again wide areas where we have uh, livestock, we have tents of, of, of nomads, we have also signs of, of agriculture. So there were smaller villages within this wide space and also uh, craftsmen, handicrafts uh, places. And only in the center there was an, a special zone where was probably the Khan was, had, had his residence. So this was again a mixture of various forms of, 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 of settlement and, and, and of e e e economy. But again, very similar to what we find, or sim one could say similar to what we find, for instance, in the Uyghur case, thousands of kilometers to the east. And also similar is this. Uh, distributed residence. So there are various residences and an itinerant court. So we have here we have an inscription again of Khan Omurtak that he built uh, while he dwelt in his old house. So this is the, 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 the old palace in Bliska, another house, a palace at the Danube that he measured also the distance and in between he built also then a hill in the middle again symbolizing, marking the extent of his empire in the landscape marking this as an imperial landscape ru uh, ruled and used by the, by, by, the, by the Khan. 
and this other palace most probably uh, this is also on the basis of the distance uh, mentioned would be in Silistra uh, Dorostolon at the Danube but also around please additional uh, residential complexes or, or, or complexes have been identified uh, so the Plisk, of course, the largest of these complexes, but also another place which is also mentioned by Omotak, the Aula of Omotak, which has been identified, also another palatial complex, and also the place of Kabiuk. And all these marked this, what is called in this inscription, the campus, so the area, the camp of Pliska, as the central region of, of this empire with various distributed places. So we, we could connect this to the one could say step traditions which we find in the Uyghur case, but uh, at the same time also Omotak was trying to present him, him, himself also on similar footing to the Byzantine Emperor. So we have this medallion where he is more or less depicted uh, like a Byzantine Emperor, uh, even with somehow the cross in the hand, although he was not Christian. Uh, he is uh, referring to himself as uh, God-given Archon, the ruler of, of, of his realm. Uh, so that's that's these are all very interesting parallels also to various imperial tradition which merge in this Bulgarian imperial project. Um, again, as after the peace of 7, 6, 16, 7, 17, uh, this uh, peace treaty was uh, a lucky coincidence for Constantinople because again Constantinople was uh, shortly afterwards encountering a threat this time from the interior. So Leon V uh, uh, was replaced by his former comrade Michael II. Both of them had served in the army. And then there was a third uh, former uh, fellow uh, warrior, and this was Thomas, called Thomas the Slav. Um, although his ethnic origin and his identification is now disputed, also Juan Sines Cordonia has uh, now the theory that there are actually two Thomases which I somehow merged in the sources, but of, at least we can say there was one Thomas who was leading a rebellion against Michael II. He was able to find also support from various groups serving in the Byzantine army as mercenaries, and so the Byzantine sources mention a long list of barbarians from their perspective, Hagarens, this would be Arabs, Egyptians, Indians, also groups from the steppes, Huns, maybe Khazars, Czechs, so a, a very multi-ethnic group and at the same time uh, Thomas was also able to find a lot of support among the armies in Asia Minor and on this basis he marched then towards Constantinople and laid siege to the regime in Constantinople under Michael II. However, like the Arabs uh, around 100 years ago, he was not able to conquer Constantinople and like in the case of the Arab siege, uh, or again the Bulgars intervened and attacked Thomas from the rear. And all this then contributed to the eventual collapse of, of, of the, the uh, rebellion of Thomas and Michael II was able to maintain his power. Uh, so we find the Bulgars in very close diplomatic connections with Byzantium. Um, of course, sometimes also in conflict. And the same is now true increasingly also for the Western, the Frankish Empire. As we have seen, the Bulgars had expanded to the west after the collapse of the Ava uh, Canate and had become more or less neighbors, at least of the Frankish sphere of interest in the Danube region. And this led also to direct contact. It also led to conflict, but also to direct diplomatic contacts. So we have also the Bulgars more or less uh, also negotiating on eye level to a certain extent with the big empires uh, of Christian Europe at the time. Um, this is true under Umotak and then under his uh, success in San Malamir. During the reign of Malamir, we also have a first episode indicating beginning Christianization of the Bulgars, and this is connected to Enravota, another son of Umotak, a brother of Malamir, originally the elder son, but since Enravota was by a Christian captive, a bishop, uh, convinced to accept Christianity, he was excluded from succession by Omotak, and eventually then Malamir then had his brother killed in 833, so he became the first martyr of the then later emerging Bulgarian church. Around that time, we also have another layer of uh, 
transformation to the steps and connections between Constantinople and the Frankish Empire. And this I've mentioned also in another uh, presentation on this channel, uh, which is devoted especially to the Varangians. And this is the, the appearance of, of what is called Taurus Scythians in the Byzantine sources, also, also the Rus. And these are Varangian groups, Vikings from Sweden especially, who traveled via the Eastern European rivers to the Islamic world and also to Byzantium. And one of these groups then made it to Constantinople, but then was not able to return via Eastern Europe and then was sent together with a Byzantine delegation to the Frankish Emperor, Louis the Pious, to Ingelheim in Germany. And they are mentioned in the Frankish Annals that they were sent by the, uh, the Byzantines. And then these this people are called Ross and they call their King Hagan which is interesting because obviously this early Ross establishing themselves now as power in Eastern Europe were accepting or using the imperial title by the neighboring especially powerful Khaza Empire, so the Kagan. Um, this, this, this encounter then at the Frankish uh, court, however, also does not end very pleasant for the uh, Varangians or the Ross because eventually then the, um, the Frankish uh, uh, Diplomats or Frankish courtiers find out that these people are actually Vikings. Uh, so relatives of the same people at that time already plundering the coasts of the empire. And so they uh, then kept uh, more or less yeah, in prison or under arrest. Uh, but it's an interesting episode and the first um, indication of this Varangian Constantinople connection. Um, as I've said, these groups traveled from um, Eastern Scandinavia via the Baltic Sea, via the rivers to Constantinople, but also to, to the Islamic world. And of course, there they encountered now the, the Khazar realm. And this may be one of the backgrounds why obviously there were some signs of turmoil in the Khazar realm. And under these uh, conditions, the Khazars then again tried to reactivate the alliance with Byzantium. And this is uh, this episode of the building of Sarkel. So obviously in order to, to secure their position, the Khazars planned to build a fortress at the river Don, uh, which is Sarkel, which means the White House in the language as we learned from the Byzantine source. And Emperor Theophilus, the dating now, this is again to, uh, to the new book of Juan Sines Cordionia is now 831, sent a Spataro Candidatos, so a commander Peteronas Camatidos, uh, with fleets from Constantinople, but also from Paphlagonia, first to Kherson, and from there they traveled on to uh, the Don, and then built their Sarkel, also using Byzantine fortification techniques. Uh, Sarkel is one of the big sites where we also actually know the name, which had been excavated originally in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. However, in the 1950s, this entire site disappeared in a dam lake, when there was a, a power plant was built there, so it's also lost, unfortunately, to archaeology. But this indicates that there were things going on in the step, one could say. And this has been uh, connected maybe to the beginning of the appearance of the, the, the Varangians, of the Rus. And we have here also then the reference that actually then the, the Rurik and his descendants then, uh, and these Varangians came into contact and also conflict that they took over Kiev, which originally was under the suzerainty of the Khazars. So we have the, here the beginning of the conflict. And another theory is that we have also movements from the east to the west, which have been connected with the my westwards migration of the Madias, or later the Hungarians. Of course, there's also a lot of, of debate where they originated from, how these various places, which are later mentioned the sources, how they can be identified and located. Um, I won't get into this too much, uh, but uh, there's also the idea that this building of Sarkel can be connected to terminals, which may be connected also to the movement of the Madias, who uh, for a certain period then later were also under the overlordship of the Khazars. This can be can be as far we, we, we can reconstruct from the sources. Maybe we will talk about the Madias in another episode. Um, that we have some changes or, 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 or upheavals in the step in the wider region uh, perspective at this time can also be identified for the Uyghur Empire. Uh, because the Uyghur Empire, like the 
First Eastern Turkish Khanate eventually collapsed also around the time in the 830s, uh, early 840s. Um, we hear about civil wars. We have already heard we had this coup d'etat in 780. So infighting was going on again and again. So the civil wars were also uh, weakening the cohesion of the empire. One group of this uh, civil in the civil war then eventually allied with the Kyrgyz, a group to the northwest uh, of the uh, Uyghur, who were regarded the arch enemies, and this alliance eventually then conquered Ordu Balik, so the center was destroyed and never settled again. So this is how also this empire came to an end. But as in the case of the Eastern Turkish Khanate in the 630s, this has been connected by Nikon Ali Cosmo and his team, uh, also consisting of paleo-environmentalists, with paleo-environmental evidence and also with Chinese sources which indicated we had a series of severe winters uh, in this uh, period, time and again, who, like in the case of the Eastern Turkish Khanate, may have contributed to the weakening of these uh, of the Uyghur Federation, uh, destroying the, the, the animals, the, the, the basis of the economy. However, uh, one has to ask then also if such conditions would then not have also affected the Kyrgyz, who were also steppe people, or why they did not affect them to the same uh, amount. Uh, so it can be only one part of the explanation. Uh, and the other would be then especially inner political conditions, which now contributed to the fall of the Uyghurs. But again, it could be also, if we think about these climatic parameters, that they form one common basis, also contributing to thermals on both sides of the Eurasian steppe belt in this period. Um, the Uyghurs, as we have heard, had converted partly and for some time and then again to Manichism, at least the elites. Um, and we also have a religious conversion, as we will see in the Kaza case and also in the Bulgar case, then in the 9th century. In the Kaza case, uh, we have, of course, several options. Christianity, we have heard that already in the late 7th century, we have Christian missionaries coming to the Kaza realm. We hear about a considerable Muslim uh, presence, which is especially connected to people from Khorezm, to Central Asian region, to the south of Lake Aral. Uh, thousands of a group from there, we hear originally they emigrated there due to famine and an epidemic, uh, joined the service of the of the Khazar Khan, who on this basis made himself also independent from um, the warriors of, of the leading figures of his own uh, uh, ethnic group. So that we also see like the Varangian got in Constantinople to have foreign uh, warriors in one service is somehow ben could, can somehow be beneficial. In the Kaza case, these are especially these warriors from Khorezm, who were Muslims. And this led to a big Muslim presence. We also hear about mosques in the Kaza Empire. So also Islam would have been an option. However, as we have said, the Kaza Khan then and the Kaza elite then decided to convert to Judaism. And we have, we have one description uh, from a later historian, a historian that they really accepted Judaism with all his regulations of the Sabbath, of the rituals, of, of, of the prohibition of specific uh, animal street and so on. Um, however, there's connected to this conversion, there are several problems also in scholarship. One has been the idea that this religious conversion also contributed to the emergence of a peculiar political system, which is only tangible in the, the 9th, 10th century. And this that there is a double head of state that we have the Kagan, as he is also mentioned in earlier sources on the Kasas, and then a new leader, the Pech. And we see this already in this description, how the Khazars uh, were asking for the building of Sarkel. And we have a description then from the 920s by the Arab uh, uh, dip diplomat and traveler Ibn Fadlan, that he says that there's the Kagan, that there's the Kagan, who is more or less a symbolic figure. And then there's the Beg, the Pech in the Byzantine sources, who really leads, leads the armies and rules them and takes care of the state. So we have more or less a ceremonial figure and an actual executive ruler. And this has also been compared to other in description of such a double head headed state, which we have in other step polities. 
Uh, around the same time, there are also some similar phenomena in the Bulga case, where we have uh, the Khan Malamir and then, then his successor and a Kafkan Isbul, who is mentioned between the 830s and the 850s, as also in this in these inscriptions as also being an important leader. However, this may also be connected to the, the minority that some of these rulers in the Bulga uh, realm were underage and then there was also say if necessary to have another actual leader of, of, of the army. But it's, it's an interesting parallel. And of course, even more contested or debated is the actual date of the uh, conversion of the Khazars to Judaism. Although they even now studies who even say this that's all fiction. Uh, Saul Stampfer made such a study a few years ago, but I would guess that's a little bit over interpreting or, the, or under interpreting the sources. Um, the dating of the conversion of the Casas is, is, is problematic since there are several dates in the sources. Um, there's this famous letter exchange between the Casa ruler Joseph and Hasta ibn Shabrut, who was a Jewish uh, vizier at the Umayya court in Spain. And in this text, it was mentioned that this conversion took place 340 years before the time of this letter exchange. This would be in 615. However, since in these conversion stories, they are also mentioned um, Muslims and there's a debate of, of religions at the court. Uh, this is a little bit improbable because there was no um, established Islamic religion around that time. Then we have the famous Sefer HaKuzari of Yehuda HaLevi, a Jewish scholar of the 11th, 12th century, who used this Kaza setting for, for an important theological work. And he says that this conversion took place 400 years before his time. This would be around 740. Then we have in al Masudi in an Arab chronicle mentioned that already at the time of Harun al Rashid, this would be around 800 CE, the Khazars had became Jews. Uh, so this was the third option. Then we have had the interpretation of Constantine Zuckerman, which is a French Byzantinist, uh, uh, one of the leading figures in, in our field and, and knows many, many languages. And he had the idea because there's also the mentioning of, of, of a missionary trip of Constantine Kirill and method to the Khazars, um, that this is actually the debate between the three religions, which is also mentioned in the other traditions. So the Christian representatives would have been constant in Kyrill and method. So therefore the, uh, the conversion of the Casa should be dated to this trip, which can be very much firmly dated to around 8, 860. So very relatively late conversion. However, the problem to a certain extent is now solved due to archeological evidence connected to the increasing amount of Arabic silver, which traveled to Eastern and Northern Europe in the 9th and 10th century. As we have seen, there's an intensification also of the North-South uh, connection, trade connection between uh, the Arab world, uh, the Khaza realm, and then also via the Varangians to Scandinavia and Western Europe. So we have hundreds of coinage, silver hordes, of Arabic coinage. This is map is from the project of Marek Jankowiak in, in Oxford, who will publish a book on this uh, soon. And in one of these hoard finds on the island of Gotland uh, in the Baltic Sea, we also found imitations, Kaza imitations of Arabic silver coins in 1999. And the, they followed the Arab model, but instead of the inscription, uh, Muhammad is the prophet of God, God uh, there we read that Moses is the prophet, the messenger of God. And this word can be dated and these coins can be dated to 837, 838. And this is now a firm terminus antiquem. So sometimes before the, Arab, the Khazars had converted to Judaism or the Khaza elite, this which would fit within the dating of, of Al-Masud, so maybe around 800 in the time of Harun al-Rashid. However, in 860, as we have seen, there was also an attempt to Christianize the Khazars. So the famous two brothers, Constantine Kirill and Method, were sent from Constantinople to the Khazars. And in the life of Kirill, we also have a description that, of course, they were successful and several hundreds Khazars were converted. However, if one reads this text, uh, one already gets the impression that they were actually operating at the Jewish dominated court because the Kagan is drinking to the one God and says, we also 
uh, are venerating the same God, but we, we, we do not follow the Christian tradition about the Trinity. And there are also Jews who stand around the Kagan and also challenge the Christian missionaries. So one gets also the impression from this text who is trying to suggest that they were successful, that actually there was already the Jewish option very well established at the, at the court of the Khazars. However, Constantine Kirill uh, and Method, of course, much more famous for than their mission to the Slavs and to the uh, great Moravian Empire. So this polity emerged, one could say, after the collapse of the Avars in the Carpathian Basin and the establishment of Frankish uh, sphere of influence in between uh, in what is now Western Slovakia, Moravia, um, as, as a polity um, under, uh, near to the Frankish uh, realm, but also challenging the Franks and Slavic speaking. And this... Um, these great Moravian rulers then eventually sent a delegation to Constantinople asking for missionaries to establish Christianity. Um, and these were Constantine Kirill and Methodios who were able to speak a Slavic language. They then invented the Glagolitic script to also write or to especially translate Christian texts to Slavonic language. However, uh, they were not the first Christian missionaries there. There were already Latin uh, clergymen from the Frankish Empire because also, of course, the Frankish and Roman Church had an interest to Christianize and to, to integrate this polity into their religious sphere of influence. Um, and what the great Moravian rulers had done, they had sent this delegation to Constantinople to counter this increasing Frankish influence on the religious level because it was more beneficial from their perspective to connect to the more distant Constantinople than to the immediate powerful neighbor of the Latin Roman tradition. And the same phenomenon we find in Bulgaria. So also we have already heard there were already earlier tendencies of Christianization also in the elite, in the, in the royal house of Bulgaria. And then eventually Khan Boris I in 864 also to contribute to a stabilization of his regime, because in the years before there were various unsuccessful campaigns also against the Moravians, the Croatians, and also the Serbs. So in 864 he accepted baptism, and his godfather was no other than the Byzantine Emperor Michael III at that time, so his new name was also Boris Michael. However, also Boris had the same idea as the Moravian ruler, and he got into contact, contact with Rome. Because from the Bulgarian perspective, it was more beneficial not to get integrated fully into the religious sphere of the powerful Byzantine neighbor, but to connect to the Roman uh, Latin church. Although the both churches at that time were, were not, uh, originally were not in the schism, uh, we have then sometime actual schism between Rome and Constantinople, which is also connected to inner Byzantine problems with connected to the Patriarch Photios, who has two terms of service. So there were inner Byzantine uh, uh, controversies, which then also included Roman intervention. It's a rather complicated story. This now got intermingled with this, this, this dispute between Rome and Constantinople over the jurisdiction in Southeastern and Eastern, or Eastern Central Europe. Um, so there was the option that the great Moravian church would become connected to Constantinople, the Bulgarian church to Rome. And however, after roughly 20 years, this dispute then was solved according to the ge geographical logic. So eventually the great Moravian church was integrated into the Latin Roman sphere and the Bulgarian church into the Byzantine sphere under um, say a certain autonomy, but still connected to the Orthodox Byzantine tradition. Um, so this, um, this, this solution, however, also included that the uh, tradition established by Constantine, Kirill and Method in the Great Moravian Empire ended to a certain extent. And the disciples of Kirill and Method then were approximately at 8550 8, expelled they had to leave Moravia, now found a new homeland in the realm of the Bulgar. 
Empire, which had just become Christianized. So also there was a demand, one could say, for, for Christian figures who especially also could speak the Slavian language, was, which was the majority language also uh, of the most of the uh, inhabitants of the Bulgar realm. So we also may then at the time such a, uh, assume that the original Bulgarian language uh, also was disappearing, at least then the, the written evidence, the written form of this Christianized empire, that's then a Slavonic uh, form of Slavonic language. And in this context, then eventually also the Cyrillic alphabet was established. However, Christianity was not yet firmly established. We have heard about um, anti manichaic uh, reaction in the Uyghur Empire. And the same took place shortly also in the Bulgar Empire. Uh, one of the sons of Boris Michael, Vladimir, then tried to uh, return to paganism. Uh, so there was a form of pagan reaction between 889 and 893. Eventually, Boris defeated Vladimir, returned also. He had become a monk and then established his other son, Simeon, on the throne. And he would then lead the Bulgar Empire, as we know, to a further peak. So that's more or less, uh, we are now at the end of the ninth century. So we have seen that this especially is a period of this religious transformation. Uh, the Khazar case and the Bulgar case, already earlier in the in the Uyghur case, and how again this also can be connected as a wider framework of these relations, this of course well-known uh, interactions between Byzantium and the steppe polity. Uh, so in the late 9th century, however, we also see that we have the emergence of new ethnicity. So we have all the established powers, uh, the Byzantine Empire, also now Bulgaria, we have the Khazars, um, we have the Chinese Empire, and this is again going to change in the next decades. We will uh, see new polities, new ethnicities, new groups emerge. The Madias have been mentioned already. Uh, the Pechenegs then will become prominent at the end of the 9th century. Uh, the Rus in, in Eastern Europe, the Oghuz in Central Asia, the Samanid dynasty due to the fragmentation also of the Caliphate, and the Kitan uh, in Eastern Asia. And maybe we will talk about this in the next episode. So at the end, um, at the end again, I would like to, to uh, give you some recommendations of literature. Uh, uh, first on the Bulgar, so on the, the early Bulgarian history. Um, one, I would say, standard work in German is the great book of Daniel Ziemann, From Wandervolk zur Großmacht, published in 2007. Daniel Ziemann also participated in these excavations uh, in Bliska. And it's a great book. It's, con it's combining the written evidence and the archaeological evidence. So it's really the best work you can find in German language. In English, on especially the connections between Byzantium and Bulgaria and these conflicts also between 775 and 831, the great book of Panos Sofulis, uh, which uh, is really a great overview about this period, which is also decisive for, say, the emergence of Bulgaria as the other Balkan empires it has also been called by, by Robert Browning, for instance. And then another book by uh, uh, Stepanov, uh, connecting Bulgaria with the wider steppe traditions, uh, also published in the same series with Brill. So this would be only some suggestions. Of course, there would be much more, but some books where we would like to have a first uh, way into 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 studying this this phenomena on the casas uh, also three books uh, i would say the nearest one could get to handbook on the casas is still this volume edited by peter golden benjamin and, and ronald Rona das based on this uh, symposium in jerusalem 1999 published in 2007 which contains many many important chapters essential on all aspects of casa history and also about the sources then uh, more recently, the book of Boris Shivkov, Kazari in the 9th and 10th centuries, especially also, of course, on the, on the wider religious transformation. And then especially on the connections between the Khazars and Byzantium. And this is in modern Greek, Ikazari Kedo Vizandio by uh, uh, Apostolus Keralidis, published in 2003. Also a very, very useful work uh, if you can read the language. And then on the, the wider framework of the steps in this period, 
the great book by Christoph Baumer, one in his series on the history of Central Asia, the second volume, The Age of the Silk Roads, covering these centuries. Um, amazing pictures, wonderful maps, so really, really a treasure, this entire book, and then really, really, really great to read. Then a more specialized study, especially of the Chinese politics, uh, to, with the these groups. It was a great book by Jonathan Kams Kaff, Sui Tang China and its Turko Mongol neighbors, which also has many, many interesting parallels to the Byzantine politics to, uh, towards these groups. So one could make a very interesting comparisons. And then about this marvelous site of Karabalgasun or the Balik, this book by uh, Burkatene, Karabalgasun, Stadt der Nomaden, based also on joint German Mongol archaeological excavations there. Of course, uh, some of his interpretations have found criticism. It's always the case with archaeological material, but it's a wonderful uh, synthesis with wonderful graphs and maps and gives a great uh, insight into, into this site. So with this, uh, yeah, now we all, all, it's really 19 minutes. I'm sorry that it was so long this time. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email. As I've, these presentations are really for a wider audience, so it's not for a specialist. It's more to give people maybe an insight in some actual also contents of, of scholarship on these topics. I hope they are useful for this. And maybe we'll continue with another episode covering the next centuries. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.